Greetings to the brethren. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Christ Jesus. So the sermon I have uh, prepared for you guys tonight, I've been working on it uh, for at least a week now, ever since I was questioning the Lord about certain passages uh, relating to justification, and it led me down a fascinating rabbit hole, which caused me to realize some very interesting things about where the Calvinists went wrong uh, and where different denominations have gone wrong in certain ways. Uh, and so it's been a fascinating journey, and today I've got a sermon prepared on it. I've prayed to the Lord that if possible, the cup of blathering on and on and on for hours may pass from me, but only if the Lord wills it. Uh, so we'll see what he wills. And just another reminder that uh, the cup which the Lord Jesus Christ has already drank down for all of us is really far more difficult than anything that we have to go through. So everyone, let's appreciate the Lord Jesus and what he did for us, and let's serve the Lord with joy, wherever that takes us. So the question I would like to address uh, in this sermon is the question, I'll put it this way, are there contradictions in the Bible? Uh, and I'll give you a short answer here. No, there are not contradictions in the Bible as we understand them as being, you know, a sort of a mistake where one thing goes against another. There are not. However, there is a property called antinomy. So it took me a week to pronounce this word correctly because I kept saying antimony, which is an element, but antinomy, what is it? Well, it's essentially a quality of paradoxicalness or seeming contradiction. You may be familiar with uh, the word nomology or nomological, which basically refers to something that has to do with laws. Not like human laws that a legislature passes, but like laws of nature, like natural law, you know, like the law of gravity or something like that. And this goes deep, my friends, because in order to correctly understand God's word, we have to understand antinomy. Because if we don't, we can fall into an error, which I believe is at the very heart of what drove the Calvinists off the path. Uh, and not to say that everything the Calvinists believe is wrong. I've seen quotes by John Calvin where I thought, you know, amen, he said he put it well. But I believe at the heart of Calvinism, there is a mistake which Calvin or the Calvinists make, which led them to produce all of this false doctrine. And if I had to summarize it, I would say that they refuse to accept or possibly even to understand antinomy. Um, because God clearly shows us antinomy operating within uh, the Bible. And I, I was led to prepare this because the other day I was pestering uh, God with questions, as I like to do. <laughs> and I was looking at the passage from uh, James. Let me quote it here. I believe it's James 2, uh, in which, yes, James 2, 21, where it is written, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Man, I'd love to be called the friend of God. That's like, that's such a cool thing to be called. Um, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. You know, I saw that, but then I'm seeing all these other passages of scripture that seem to say the exact opposite. Just to name a couple, there's many of them, but a couple, for example, Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, or Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Again, compare that to... Ye see then how by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. And yet, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? 
And so I watched various videos on it. R.C. Sproul has a, a great video on it. I thought it was very interesting. I looked at different theories as to how can we resolve this, what, what is called harmonizing the scriptures. And I went before the Lord and I asked him, Lord, uh, can we harmonize it this way? Is it this? I presented different theories and the Lord kept shooting down all my different attempts to harmonize it. And I was racking my brains as often happens when I'm talking to the Lord, like, Lord, is it this? No. What about this? And Finally, after seemingly exhausting every option, saying maybe the word justified means justified in God's sight versus in men's sight. You know, maybe the way, like how it says wisdom is justified by our children. Lord, is it this? No, is it this? And finally, after a while, I said, Lord, is there some kind of antinomy going on here? And he said, yes. And so I started to talk to him about antinomy. And I said, so this antinomy, it's a real thing that that's a property you have or that's in your word. It really exists. And he said, Yes. And so then I said, okay, if it's antinomy, then I can't understand it with my mind. Uh, should I keep trying to figure it out anyway? And he said, no. He told me to accept the antinomy. Um, and again, what antinomy is, is it's a seeming contradiction. It's an apparent uh, set of irreconcilable or mutually exclusive truths that lead to a sort of paradox. Um, and after that, the Lord sent me down a path of finding other scriptures and seeing how this antinomy operates in the Bible. And as I said, it lead me to seeing, to, to see that the, uh, the air of the Calvinists is that they either don't understand the antinomy or they reject it. Um, and so I'm going to give a few examples of, uh, seeming contradictions in the Bible that actually aren't contradictions. Cause what I found is, in my limited experience so far, about nine out of 10 times that the Bible seems to contradict itself, it's actually that we need a deeper understanding of it. And if you put it more in context and look at more pieces of it, you see, ah, it's actually not a contradiction. You just have to have a deeper understanding. However, about one in 10 times, that is not the case. One in 10 times, you're actually seeing a true antinomy. Um, and one simple example of this um, well, first, let me go through a couple seeming contradictions that if you understand the word more deeply are not contradictions, and then I'll get into the actual antinomies. And this is very important because if I had to, to summarize it here, what I would say is this, the Calvinists erred because they could not accept that there would be truths which their own reason or their own wisdom could not understand. For example, the Bible might say, a is true, B is true. And so the Calvinists, and not just the Calvinists, but many of us perhaps might say, okay, if A is true and B is true and we combine those together, it must mean C is true. But then the word of God tells us C is false, right? We might say, but if A is true and B is true, then doesn't C have to be true? And that may seem correct according to our logic. But if the word of God tells us C is false, well then guess what? C is false because the word of God is never wrong. But in order to do this, we have to have humility. We have to be able to accept that even though something seems totally contradictory to us, that the universe does not operate according to our logic or our understanding. It operates according to God's logic and his understanding. And our understanding is limited. Logic is great. A lot of things that people say in the Bible, oh, that's illogical. Like I said, you look at it more deeply, you find it's actually not. It makes sense. However, there are some things which are not really contradictions, it's antinomy. Antinomy is a limit to our understanding. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing the limits to our understanding. You're not seeing an actual contradiction. What you're seeing is that logic's great, it, it goes up to here, that's wonderful, but you're going to reach a point where human logic simply cannot grasp it or understand it. And at that point, you have to ask yourself, you have a choice. You can basically say, well, that means that I'm going to start to rearrange the Bible to fit with my logic and reasoning. That's exactly what the Calvinists chose to do. But I believe the correct choice is to say, okay, it seems like a contradiction to me and I can't understand it, but God says it's still true. Well, then it's still true. <laughs> you can just accept it on faith. We must accept that there are limits to our understanding. And uh, to start this off, I'd like to quote Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. Because some people might say, well, Evan, does the, the Bible doesn't have the word antinomy, right? And I would point out... Uh, this here. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Notice this. 
forsaking our thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So here we have God telling us that his thoughts are not ours. And this, I believe, is where the antinomy comes in. There are things that seem like they must be a contradiction according to the limited grasp of our own reason. But God tells us, I'm not limited in the way that you are. Your limitations of logic are not contradictions in my truth. They're limits to your understanding. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Because essentially, what's happening when we refuse to accept the antinomy is that we're saying it can't be this and this. That's, that's impossible. That's illogical. That can't be. Of course, Luke one thirty seven tells us, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. So, and while we're at it, let's throw in 1 Corinthians 1. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish, foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For, this is verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So here we're seeing a theme which we see throughout the scripture. You know, other, another part of the scripture tells us that the Greeks seek after wisdom that they value human wisdom. Of course, book of Proverbs and other parts of the scripture show us that really the only real wisdom is the wisdom of God, and we cannot access it by reasoning. No matter how smart we are, God has to grant it to us, which he will if we are willing to receive it. You know, wisdom shouts from the rooftops, attention, everyone, who wants some wisdom? It's right here. And most people just keep on walking by. Um, so the mistake which the Calvinists make is that they believe that their own logic, their own reason, is the thing that they trust in, that they have faith in. Now, there's nothing wrong with, you know, using your own logic or using the mental gifts God gave you. That's great. But when it comes up against the Word of God directly, we should be willing to abandon it and accept that God's thoughts are higher than ours, and they're simply things that we cannot comprehend. Um, essentially, the mistake that the Calvinists and others make is that they lean into their own understanding, and they're willing to trust and have faith in their own understanding, even when it comes up against the Word of God. Of course, the Word of God tells us, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. Because if you do lean into your own understanding, you can come up with something like the tulip doctrine, which clearly is directly contradicted by Scripture, and yet you still believe it, because that's what your own understanding says that it has to be. But God warns us against this. Um, so let's look at some examples of seeming contradictions, which actually aren't, and then let's get to the true antinomies. So one example of an apparent contradiction might be the fact that the word of God tells us that there are none righteous. No, not one. You know, Jesus says, why callest thou me good? Only God is good. Um, and yet, and this is by the way, where the Calvinists get the total depravity that everything we do is evil, that we're not even capable of doing any good, that we're just completely depraved, right? So that would seem to, to fit with this whole idea that there are none righteous. And yet, you know, I've just been reading through the book of Proverbs, and the whole first section of it is basically contrasting the righteous way to do things, the way of the righteous, and what God is going to do for them, versus the unrighteous, or the foolish, or the wicked, and what God is going to do to them. And in fact, the word of God tells us, let me find it, um, Matthew 5, 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. But wait, aren't there none that are righteous? But yet the whole book of Proverbs is telling us if you act righteously, this is what God will do. So I don't believe this is a true antinomy. And I believe you can see a little key to it in that 
Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. But what you may not notice is that we do have righteousness because it says our righteousness. Now, I believe what's happening here is that you have the righteousness of men because look, clearly some people behave more righteously than others. Even the same person may behave more righteously on one day than on another day. But if we contrast this to the righteousness of God, God's righteousness is a perfect righteousness. God is 100% righteous. There is no darkness in him whatsoever. However, no human being by their own efforts ever is going to achieve 100% righteousness. Well, the only one who did was our Lord Christ Jesus, but of course he is the second person of God, so he was able to do that, and we, we do not. Um, so it's not that we can't, it's not that we're not righteous at all, it's just that our righteousness compared to God's righteousness is like filthy rags, and yet we still can act righteous to some degree, which you can clearly tell from all the instruction in the scripture to seek after righteousness and behave righteously. You know, let's say that you're 20% righteous, well, you can move up to 21% or something. You're never going to get to 100 righteousness. Uh, and in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need 100% righteousness. But the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you upon the moment that you believe and are saved. So that's that's why I see that as not as a true antinomy. It's just that there's levels of righteousness. There's perfection, which is God's standards, and there's ours, you know, of which people, some people have, like Hitler, probably had like 1% righteousness, and, you know, someone else might have 70% if they're doing really well, you know, so there there is a variation. That's why the total depravity says we're all at zero all the time. But clearly, uh, that's not the case. Anyway, I'll get down to refuting all the points in Tulip uh, a little bit later. But that's a sort of a seeming antinomy, which if you look at it deeper, in my opinion, is not an antinomy because um, it's not all or nothing. You can still have degrees of righteousness in how you behave, but you're never going to get to 100%. And by the standard of God, our righteous, even 99% is nothing compared to the perfect righteousness of God because it's just imperfection compared to perfection. But within imperfection, though, there's a lot of variability. And that's why we see all these things in the book of Proverbs saying that, you know, if you go after the adulteress, that's unrighteous. But if you do the more righteous thing, God will reward you and he won't suffer the, uh, I believe it says, the soul of the righteous to famish. So that's why it seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Another, uh, a more concise example might be the question, can Christians sin? Okay, so if we look in the book of 1 John, we see uh, 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. But wait, the same book of 1 John tells us, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But what? But it just said, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So this is an example where if you have a deeper understanding of it, what we see is that when we're reborn, the Holy Spirit enters us and performs a spiritual circumcision, which separates the new man, the Holy Spirit born creature of God from our flesh. And so our flesh always has the sin in it. Our flesh still has the sin, but the new man within us does not sin. It's our body or our flesh that sins. So that's what it's referring to when it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And yet it is true that the new man within us, which the Holy Spirit has separated from our flesh, uh, cannot sin. Um, so that's the example of that. That's why it's it's not an antinomy, because those are both true at once. And if you have a deeper understanding, it makes sense. Oh, check out Robert Breaker's uh, sermon on this subject about sin and the spiritual circumcision that the Holy Spirit performs and how it resolves this seeming contradiction. Okay, so let's get to the uh, examples of actual antinomy. So one of the most clear ones is this question. Is God one or is he three? This is an example of antinomy. Because according to human reason and understanding, if something equals one, then it can't equal three. If it equals three, it can't equal one. It can't be both three and one because they're different numbers. However, God is both three and one. God is one, and yet he's three separate persons at the same time. Um, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And yet they're also separate persons of God. Uh, by the way, I'll insert this here. If you want to see a very early example of the Trinity in the scripture, you can check out Genesis 18, um, where it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham 
near the large trees of Mamre. <laughs> I pronounced that. Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent. It was the hottest time of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. See how it said the Lord, but then it said he saw three men. So he quickly left the entrance to his tent to greet them. He bowed low to the ground. He said, my Lord, if you are pleased with me, don't pass me by. Isn't it interesting how he didn't say my Lord's? So it's you're seeing here that it's mixing it being singular versus it being plural. He addresses them as one, my Lord, if you are pleased, don't pass me by. Let me get you some water. Then all of you can wash your feet. Now it's like he's switching to addressing three people and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, to give you strength. Then you can go on your way. I want to do this for you now that you have come to me. He doesn't say you guys or something like that. He addresses it again as singular. All right. They answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get about 36 pounds of the finest flour, prepare it and bake some bread. Oh, if Abraham said that to a woman in our current time, cook something. Whoa, that would just be terrible. Can you imagine the gall that he had to ask his wife to cook something? Oh my gosh, we'd have to throw him into feminist prison right away. Death penalty. That's what I'm feeling. <laughs> but, you know, uh, his wife was just wickedly oppressed and, you know, labored under the travails of having to cook something, which, you know, who can even imagine? <laughs> Then uh, he ran over to the herd. He picked out a choice tender calf. He gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some butter and milk and the calf that had been prepared. He served it to the three men. <laughs> so that's just an example of where, but is it one? Is it three? It's both at once, baby. That is antinomy. <laughs> God is one. Jesus and the Father are one and they're separate and they're one and they're separate. But it can't be logically. Well, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we should seek after the wisdom of God. And the deepest wisdom of God is being humble and accepting that if God says it's true, well, then it's true. You know, if God tells me there is no gravity, I'll be like, okay, there's no gravity. <laughs> Why do I say that? Because, dude, it works. If <laughs> You just trust God. You believe what he says. You see it. Just trust it. Just accept it. But what we're going to see is that the air which different groups, different denominations make is, is that if you ever elevate something to the point where you have more faith in that thing than you do the word of God, there you err. And what we see is that different denominations have a tendency to place something above the word of God in terms of authority, and that's where we make mistakes. The Calvinists like to do it with their own logic or their own reasoning. Because if you refuse to accept antinomy, what you're essentially saying is, I refuse to accept that my own reasoning could be limited. I refuse to accept there's anything that I couldn't logically understand. So if the Bible seems to point to a contradiction, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start bending it and coming up with my own doctrine that essentially negates parts of the Bible so that it will fit comfortably within my own mind and my own reasoning. And it all comes from a sort of intellectual pride, right? Because look, if you want to read the Bible and try to come to your own understanding, dude, I'm, I'm doing that all day long. I think it's great. I think the Lord loves it when we're struggling to understand his word. But if the conclusion you draw then clearly contradicts the Bible, what you should do is accept that your conclusion is wrong, uh, not that the Bible is wrong. But in order to do that, you have to accept that there is antinomy, that God can be one and three at the same time. We don't perceive anything in our world that can do that. It's either one or it's three. But that does not apply to God. That just shows our understanding is limited when it comes to the highest spiritual truths. Um, so... That's the mistake that the Calvinists make is they want to, they refuse to accept that, that there's things that wouldn't fit in their understanding. And so that's why they start to make up their own tulip doctrine, which look, if you just make up some strange theory about how the Bible is, you know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you start to say my theory is true and the Bible, these verses are false. I mean, the Calvinists don't exactly say the scripture is false, but really they do because the tulip has elements in it that are clearly completely against the Bible. Like, for example, saying that the atonement is limited when the Bible again and again says that it's not in a bunch of verses. Anyway, I'll get to those uh, a little bit later. Um, but so that's one example of true antinomy. And the, I'm going to reference here um, the example which I found, which sent me on this whole journey, which is justification. Is faith, uh, does it need works? Is anything justified by works or is it just faith? And 
And what we see here, as I mentioned in James versus Romans and Galatians, is that it seems to be completely contradictory. And not only that, but we see that Paul, the writer of Romans, and James are pointing to the exact same verse and then drawing two conclusions which seem to be utterly mutually exclusive. How strange that they're even pointing to the same verse, right? Like the the verse is, it's Genesis 15, 6, where it says, talking about Abraham, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So they draw two conclusions that appear to be diametrically opposed. And yet the scripture presents both as being true simultaneously. This is antinomy. Um, so, uh, yep, I read that part of the scripture. So isn't it interesting that they're pointing to the exact same thing, drawing two conclusions, and yet the scripture puts them both in front of us. It's not, it's not like God didn't know that. or Because a contradiction would be like if you're not paying attention and one part doesn't synchronize with another part, that's a contradiction. But do you believe God's aware of everything that's in the Bible? He he puts both of those words in their mouths or in their pen through the Holy Spirit and says both are true. And we see that throughout the scripture that it's not like um, Paul was somehow against James or something. They both act as if they're just both on the same page. And yet they're presenting these two conclusions that seem to contradict each other. And yet they're being presented as if they don't because that's antinomy. The same way that it's not a contradiction to say that God is one and also three. Um so, uh, and oh, one other scripture I wanted to point to, which expresses this idea that our thoughts are limited, that we cannot fully understand. We're seeing through a glass darkly, meaning we can't fully see everything. Later, when we are in heaven with the Lord, then we will be known as, we will know as we are known. And of course, we're known completely, perfectly by the Lord. Then we will know. Then we will see, I believe, in the spiritual reality that, oh, it's not a contradiction. Oh, of course, they can both be true at once. But the Lord warns us that for now, it's not that we haven't done that yet or that just no one has been able to understand it yet. The Lord tells us you can't. <laughs> it's impossible because his thoughts are higher than ours. First Corinthians 2 9 says, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So depending on which translation you look at this, you could, the neither have entered into the heart of man. That's often translated as no one has imagined, right? God speaks about the heart as being the place of imagination. So God's saying here, you can't even imagine the things that I've prepared for those who love me. Not that like no one's done it yet or someone should try to imagine a bit more. It's like, no, it's impossible. There's things that are just beyond our comprehension while we are in this mortal realm. Um, so moving on a bit, to, uh, and what's interesting is like this other scripture in 1 Corinthians 1 shows how it appears to be foolish to wise men of the world, right? Because God has cho chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's exactly what's happening with John Calvin. John Calvin, a, a very intelligent man, you know, and there's many uh, preachers that have followed in his tradition. First thing you notice about the Calvinists, if you just look at them, they're very logical. They love logic. Now, again, Logic's not bad. I like logic too. But you have to accept with humility that logic, which really is your logic, because when you're saying, but logically this is this is true, what you're really saying is by my understanding of logic, this and this has to be true. But let's call it God's logic or God's thoughts are higher than ours. And the thing about the Calvinists is they're so in love, like the Greeks, with their own wisdom, their own logic, that they're willing to hold that uh, above the word of God, and that's where they make a mistake. Now, look, they say a lot of great things. You know, John MacArthur, he has tons of great stuff. You know, I like how they'll pick like one sentence in the Bible and preach about it for an hour or two. I think that's wonderful. But where we make a mistake is when we start to bend the word of God to fit our own limited personal understanding. Um, that's where we make a mistake. Um, oh, let me just throw in... Uh, Romans 4, 2 here, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. There, that's where you see Paul quoting the exact same thing from Genesis, but drawing what appears by our reasoning to be the opposite conclusion. And yet God tells us that they're not mutually uh, exclusive, that somehow they're both true because they're both presented in his word. Um, so, 
Uh, I mean, I wrote it this way. When we have faith in something other than the word of God to the point that we are willing to overturn the word of God to conform to the thing that we have faith in, in doing so, we err. And this is a, a really quickly, I'll just address what I perceive. Uh, one way you can kind of look at the justification. Is it by faith? Is it by works? The way that I see it is what triggers the whole process of us being saved is when we willingly, with our free will, choose to believe the truth which is specifically the truth of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's what gets the whole ball rolling. When we believe that, that's when we are saved. And as a result of uh, being saved, we then are inevitably going to do certain works. Someone pointed out something interesting about the thief on the cross. Even he did like one good work, which was, you know, he said in front of people that he believed Jesus was the son of God. So the way I see it, you know, the best that we can probably understand it is that uh, I believe it all comes from the faith. Faith is what springs from it. And I wanted to point out that in the book of James, people often present it as if James is arguing against faith, or if he's saying like, no, it's not faith, it's works. But if you actually look at how it's written, he's not saying faith versus works. He's saying like true faith versus like a dead faith or an inadequate faith. And he's never saying that like the works are what saved you. He's saying like the works are what show that the faith is true. And that's what's what saves you. If you read it closely, you see that, you know, he says like, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. He didn't say like, like the faith was great, but the works are what got it over the top. He said the works made the faith perfect. Um, and uh, he says, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? And he said, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not the things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So he doesn't say, Show me your faith and I'll show you my works. He's really saying, show me your faith and I'll show you my true faith. So he doesn't actually speak against faith at any point. He's really using the works to sort of prove his faith. Um, so anyway, uh, again, I think there is true antinomy here, so we can't fully comprehend it with our mind, but I would simply put it this way. Yes, we are saved by faith alone, and yet that faith also has works and it's not a contradiction trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The most important thing to know is that works in and of themselves cannot save us. No amount of good works can save us. You have to start with faith in Jesus Christ. That will then inevitably produce certain works, and those works are in a way showing that the faith is true, but ultimately the faith is the thing that kicks off the whole ball game. Um, so anyway, uh, the deeper point I wanted to uh, get onto was this. Um, that we make this mistake when we have faith in something over the word of God. Like the way that I look at it is the word of God sets a standard. It's like the authority for truth. Now, let's look at Calvinists, for example. They like logic and reasoning. That's great. By all means, take the word of God, try to logically reason it, see if you can come to other realizations. I think that's great. Search the scriptures, you know. But if you then come to a conclusion that directly goes against the scripture, what you should do is throw out that conclusion and go, I guess that one's wrong. But if instead you say, well, then the scripture must be wrong, or what's possibly even more dangerous that the Calvinists do is they say, well, scripture doesn't really mean what it says. It must mean something different. For God so loved the world. No, he loved the elect. That's what it meant. It's like, wait a minute. Where did you get that term elect from? Because it's in the Bible. <laughs> so God uses the word elect when he wants to say elect. But in that case, he doesn't say elect. He says the world. You know, clearly it doesn't mean the elect or he would have said it. He says elect in other places, you know, but then we start to say, oh, no, it, it doesn't really mean that, um, you know, he died just to save some people. Well, Romans 6.10 says the death he died, he died to sin once for all, you know, Calvin say, oh, well, all the elect, it doesn't say that it says once for all. Um, so let's do it, dude. I'm going to launch into the, the refutation of Tulip. I'll try to make it somewhat brief. Um, you know, why do we even need to make up some other doctrine? Why can't we just take stuff from the Bible? Why do we have to say, oh, 
you know, the Bible, you can't just understand it on your own. We're going to make up a special personal doctrine of our own that says what the Bible really means. Now, look, if you do that and it then agrees with the Bible, okay, that's fine. That's your way of understanding it. But if it directly contradicts the Bible, then we really, we got to throw out your doctrine. We can't be like, the Bible doesn't mean what it says. It means this thing that I made up and this is what you can trust. You know, I was kind of laughing the other day because, you know, the Catholics reject Sola Scriptura. But then I was watching a video of a Catholic guy who's like, yep, if you want to understand salvation, you know, we reject Sola Scriptura. You can't understand it just by reading the Bible. However, a Catholic author, you know, Linda McAllister, she wrote a book, How to Get Saved According to the Catholics. And that's what will have you understand salvation. So I thought it was kind of funny because it's like we reject that God's book could help you understand you know, salvation, but this book, this other person wrote, well, you could trust that book. So solo scripture, just not for the Bible, for stuff that the Catholics wrote. You know, so I kind of laugh at that a bit myself because, you know, if there's one book to understand salvation, wouldn't it be the book God wrote? But anyway, I don't want to scorn uh, my brethren and God warned me against scorning. That, that's not a good thing. So I'll try to keep it, you know, humorous in a lighthearted way, but not in a way that's like scorning or hatred or anything like that. Look, we all make mistakes. I know I have plenty of gaps in my own understanding. And hey, we all worship the Lord Christ Jesus, you know. So anyone, whether you're a Calvinist or a Presbyterian or a whatever, you know, hey, we're all we're all trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and understand His Word, you know. And we all have gaps in our understanding. So, uh, on to the refutation uh, of Tulip. So, all right. So total depravity is wrong because clearly we are not totally depraved. Not everything we do is unrighteous. Because if it were, it wouldn't make sense to have the book of Proverbs give us all these examples of to behave this way is unrighteous, to behave this way is righteous, which it says in a bunch of areas. So yes, we never have the perfect righteousness of God until we have faith and are reborn, in which case Christ's righteousness is imputed unto us. But clearly, even people that are unsaved can choose more righteous choices than others. Um, so... Yes, we are depraved, but we're not totally depraved. I mean, if we were just totally depraved, then it would be like, why should we even bother doing anything? And of course, the, the Calvinists kind of think that, that like, it's all just up to God. And but then why is God giving us all these imperative sentences where he says, do this, you know? And yet, if it was just that we can't even do anything, we're just kind of watching a movie and God's just puppeting everything, then why would there be all these parts telling us to like, make this choice? Unless some choices were more righteous than others, which the scripture clearly uh, tells us is the case. Um, so we can see that throughout the Bible. Yes, we do really do have free will. The Bible talks about it. So we're clearly not totally depraved. There's many examples in, in the scripture of how some choices are more pleasing to God than others. To say that they're all equally depraved is clearly wrong. That's not the case at all. And all you have to do is look at the word righteous, how it's used in the book of Proverbs that, you know, God says this is righteous and this isn't. And he helps us understand that and make the right choices. So Clearly, total depravity uh, is wrong because even the very sentence, all your righteousness is like filthy rags, shows that we do have some righteousness. Otherwise, it would say you have no righteous. But when it's saying there is none righteous, no, not one, I believe that means there's none that meet the standard of God's righteousness other than the Lord Christ Jesus. So see, even there, you could be like, but wasn't Jesus righteous? It says, no, not one. Well, Jesus <laughs> is righteous. So Clearly, that sentence doesn't mean that even Jesus wasn't righteous, because the scripture itself tells us that there was one who was righteous by the perfect standard of God, our Lord Christ Jesus. But yes, we can have degrees of righteousness, so reject the total depravity. The idea that God hates a baby in the womb and is just seething at the baby with rage. I mean, come on, guys. What do we know of God's character? Is he like that? The very fact that he gives us time and asks us to repent shows that we must be capable of doing something righteous. Why would he again and again ask people uh, to repent if we couldn't actually change our choices and it was all just God? This is a great example of where trying to use human logic leads you to these bizarre conclusions, like the idea that God is the one who's actually sinning. Since he's forcing us to do sin, if you reason that we don't really have free will, but yet God says that he hates sin. And, to say, and if God's responsible for all the sin, then why would we even need to be saved? See how just right away trying to use human logic just warps you into this strange world? But... You know, uh, it goes on. The next thing we have in TULIP is unconditional election. Okay, unconditional election is wrong because the scripture tells us that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. Uh, I forget which verse that is. I forgot to write it down. But there's a bunch of points when it says that God doesn't take pleasure in the death of any. He doesn't want any to be perish, any to perish. And yet, many do perish. 
Many people end up in hell. We know that. Scripture even tells us specific examples. The beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. Thus it is written, thus it will come to pass. And yet the Lord doesn't wish for any of them to perish. So how do we explain this? Well, there must be some condition uh, on who he elects. Because if there weren't, knowing that the Lord's will is that no one would perish, well, then no one would perish. So I don't claim to know what that condition is. Uh, it could just be something within God. It might not be some outer thing. It could be some other part of his nature stops him from doing the thing that he wishes he could do, which is to save everyone. So I don't claim to know what that condition is, but simply the fact that some people end up in hell shows that there is some condition on his election. We don't understand what it is necessarily, but if there weren't, everybody would be saved. But the way the Calvinists refute that is that they say, well, you know, it's unconditional. So therefore, if some people don't get saved, it's because God didn't want them to get saved. And right. And that leads you down this whole, you know, rabbit hole of coming of human logic leading you astray, uh, which we know is wrong because the specific verses of scripture say that God so loved the world, um, which brings me to the next one. Limited atonement is wrong because the scripture says God so loved the world, not merely the elect. He died once for all. So again and again, we see that God offers his, his grace, offers his mercy to everyone. Makes sense. If he was just biased against one person and just destroyed them and condemned them just because they were them, well, then he would be a respecter of persons. But we know God is not a respecter of persons. That right there throws off the whole uh, uh, limited atonement thing or the whole idea that the elect are some special group, because then that would mean that he just respected them. But we know he does not respect people just on the basis on the on the basis that there that some group is special. He what he respects is the choices we make. That's why he's telling us to make the right choices and telling us to seek for his kingdom and his justice and his righteousness. So uh, the atonement of Christ was certainly not limited to just some special group. Um, speaking of which, irresistible grace is wrong. Uh, because people have free will, and clearly many do resist God's grace and end up in hell. Um, let's look at Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? That right there shows that grace certainly is resistible. Because as God is saying, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, if the atonement was limited, if his election was totally unconditional, then he would just elect everyone. Because the scripture says that's what he wants. But here the Lord says he doesn't want anyone to perish. And yet he's imploring them to turn from their evil ways. Meaning they can't be 100% depraved. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be able to turn from their evil ways. Clearly, they have that choice before them. And clearly, the Lord wants them to do that. And yet, clearly, not all of them do that. Another verse which clearly refutes irresistible grace is Matthew 23, verse 37. The Lord Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest, stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. That's a clear refutation of irresistible grace because Jesus says, I would have gathered you together, but you would not. If grace were irresistible, then they would have been gathered together. But what did he say? You would not. Meaning that, yes, we have free will. And yes, a lot of people use their free will to resist God. And Jesus says, I don't want that. I would have gathered you all, but you chose not to. Um, and finally, to refute the last part of the tulip, uh, perseverance of the saints uh, is wrong. Now, I want to differentiate it. It's not the same as eternal security. Eternal security is not wrong. The uh, POS, perseverance of the saints, that's what's wrong. <clears throat> because we see an example uh, of the saints not persevering. Now, uh, let me uh, explain what I mean here. The perseverance of the saints essentially says that people who have, who have been saved will, will never fall away and start believing in something else. Um, but we see examples of it. And the simple way to, to phrase this is that salvation and repentance are not the same thing. You can lose, uh, you, excuse me, you cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose repentance. Let's define repentance here as willingly aligning your mental outlook with the truth 
of the word of God. You have free will and you can see things however you want, but when you repent is when you change your mind and make it conform with the truth of the word of God. Now you can lose that, i.e. your mind can disconform with the truth and start believing all kinds of weird things. Um, salvation cannot be lost. You can check out my other videos where I talk about that a lot, but there's many verses that explicitly say that in the Bible. Um, however, you can lose your repentance, meaning that you can start seeing things incorrectly. We know this because the scripture gives us examples of it. Um, Hebrews 6, for example, says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify uh, to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Now, many people, when they read this, it's like as if they substitute the word repentance for salvation. It doesn't say salvation. It says repentance because salvation and repentance are different things. Yes, you come to salvation by repenting, believing the gospel, and that's what gets you saved. But it's not true what the Calvinists say, that anyone who has been saved will never lose their repentance. You can lose your repentance. And not only does Hebrews say it here, but we see an example of this very thing happening in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, uh, in which we see a member of the church, someone who's saved, who's committing fornication with their own mother. And Paul basically says that he's decided to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's an example, I believe, of exactly what Paul's talking about in Hebrews 6, that if you start to go into some warped mental perspective and you start to go too far away from the truth of God, you can reach a point where God can't get you back and get you to see the truth again. And at that point, yes, your flesh can be destroyed, but it's being destroyed so that your spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So there we see a saint not persevering in repentance, and yet they still maintain their salvation because their flesh has to be destroyed. So let's pray that that uh, won't happen to us, but that's how you see the perseverance of the saints is clearly wrong. However, eternal security is clearly right because we see their, their soul, it may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So that's my brief refutation of the uh, five points of TULIP. Um, and I guess I'd like to conclude this by saying that you know, like I said, the mistake the Calvinists made was that they trusted in their own reason. They're like the Greeks with their love of wisdom, and they just couldn't accept this sort of foolishness to them that the, that God could say things like that he loves everyone and that Jesus died for the whole world, and yet a lot of people go to hell using their logic. They're like, well, then it must be that he doesn't love everyone, that there must be an elite group of the elect, which is always them, of course, the elites, you know. <laughs> and of course, the Bible does use the term elect. Ah, we're not going to go off into that whole thing of what exactly does it mean. But clearly, it doesn't mean that there's some special people that God loves that he just makes them saved and others that he just condemns because he doesn't respect persons. And yeah, that's kind of, a, that's a perfectly rational, rational, logical uh, conclusion to make. But it goes against the word of God. Accept the antinomy, except that yes, God loves everyone, but some people use their free will, refuse to believe in Jesus, suffer eternal destruction as a result. Um, let's not create our own special logical doctrine, however reasonable it seems to us, because our thoughts are not his thoughts. His thoughts are higher than ours. And so just as Calvinists made that mistake by having more faith in their own logic and reasoning and being willing to bend the word of God, word of God's the standard. Logic and reasoning, great. As long as they're matching up to the standard, we know that our logic and reasoning, well, they're, they're doing us a good service. But as soon as our logic and reasoning don't match up with the word of God, what we should do is bend our logic and reasoning to accept the word of God. And that's why God says, what's up, y'all? I got antinomy. My thoughts are higher than yours. Accept it. I'm three, but I'm also one. Let's bend our logic and reasoning to say, okay, it's three and it's one. Sounds great to me. I don't understand it, but I understand that I can't understand it. So I know it's true. Let's not say, wait, well, then it must be you become, what are they called? The non-dual Christians or something who think that God is only one. I don't know. I don't remember all the denominations. <laughs> but whenever we trust something over the word of God and bend the scripture to comport to that thing we trust, we're having more faith in something else. And that's not good. We're violating the first commandment of Moses, have no gods before God. The Calvinists do it because they love their own logic and reasoning and they don't have the humility to accept that there's just things that their mind nor anyone's mind can comprehend. 
The Catholic and Orthodox, they tend to have more faith in their traditions and in the authority of man. Again, there's nothing wrong with human traditions. There's tons of great ones. That's fine. But when you use your traditions to overrule the word of God, like they have a tradition, uh, you know, of doing necromancy, of praying to, to Mary, talking to her, asking her to intercede on their behalf. Word of God clearly tells us, don't do that. Only pray to the Lord. Don't try to appeal to any other spirit, any other person. Pray to God alone. Do not try to communicate or ask for spirits to intercede or dead people, which is literally what necromancy is. But the Catholics and the Orthodox have a long tradition of doing that. I don't know if the Orthodox do it as much. And they have a bunch of other traditions that, look, traditions are fine. But if they go against the Word of God, you should have less faith in your tradition than you do in the Word of God. And if you're like, well, the Word of God says that, but we got our tradition. Well, which one are you going to go with? You got to pick one or the other. So that's, I think, a trap that Catholics and Orthodox fall into is that they trust uh, their own tradition more. They have more faith in it and the authority of man because some Pope said it was okay. I don't care. If it goes against the Bible, the Pope's wrong. It's not that God's wrong or that we're going to, what I think is more dangerous, interpret the Bible to be like, oh no, the Bible agrees with us. We're just using a really complex way of reasoning to say that actually it doesn't mean what it says. I don't like that. I think that's spiritually dangerous. And uh, Pentecostals or Charismatics, for example, a problem they can fall into. And again, I'm not saying that all you know, Catholics do this or all Calvinists do this. I'm also saying that we don't all probably do it in some way ourselves. We probably do. You know, I'm just pointing out that a, kind of a tendency that maybe Pentecostals or Charismatics may have is if they have more faith in their own personal spiritual experience than they do the Word of God. I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but that's kind of the danger that uh, denomination can fall into is they have this powerful experience with the Holy Spirit or what they think is the Holy Spirit. Now, look, if it conforms to the Word of God, great. But if it doesn't, you should be willing to distrust your own experience and say, well, I guess my experience wasn't wrong or was wrong because I believe the word of God. Um, so that's the air they can fall into. You know, now I call them the modernists. I guess there's a lot of Pres Presbyterians who sort of believe this. But this is another thing. Another denomination or people in different denominations, they really love science. And they're like they kind of see themselves as sort of intellectual and they believe modern science and modern science says the world's billions of years old. And so then. Even though the word of God says it's not, they believe science and they don't want to accept anything that doesn't go with science. So they hold science to be a higher authority than the word of God. They're like, well, science says evolution made us. So what we really mean is that when the Bible says in the beginning, you know, God created man and woman, what it really means is in the beginning, God made the Big Bang and that went on for billions of years. And then evolution made man and woman after a long series of organisms becoming other organisms. And then and that's what the word of God means. Because deep down in their hearts, they just don't want to go against science. And so if science and the Bible are at odds, they're like, well, then science must be right. And they reinterpret the word of God to conform to modern science because that's where their hearts are really at. They love modern science. Now, look, I don't hate modern science. I think it has a lot of interesting things um, in it, but you shouldn't hold that above the word of God. That should be an opportunity to say, oh, looks like our science is wrong. Let's examine it deeply and see how... Uh, this is the case. And in fact, I specifically got asked God about this the other day. Uh, I said, uh, what is true? Is, is it true as the word of God says that the earth is literally something like that creation is literally like 6,000 years old. I don't know the exact number, but what, what's called the young earth theory, or is it actually true that it's like millions of years old or whatever? And God told me that the young earth theory is true. It's literally as the Bible presents, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's as it says. There's a reason why you can get that out of the Bible, because if you just interpret it literally, the earth is 6,000 years old. And God told me, yes, that was true. He also said I could tell that to others. So there you go. It's not much, you know, I'm just a guy on YouTube, but that's what he told me. And that's what I believe. And most importantly, it's what the Bible says, <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's in there. But people who are the, I call them the modernist Christians, they are like, they want to believe in you know, evolution, and they want to believe that the earth has to be really old. The funny thing is, if you actually dig into it scientifically, what you'll find is that there's all kinds of science that that doesn't uh, back that up. Like you might think if you haven't actually looked into carbon dating or looked in, I was watching this video of a guy who's a fluvial geomorphologist, this guy who studied uh, the, the way that water reshapes the earth for his whole career, like 40 years, he's an expert on it. And he ended up becoming a Christian because he found so much evidence that there had been a flood in relatively recent history that it affected the whole earth. I'm not going to try to summarize it all, but what you'll find if you look is that the supposed scientific evidence is actually far 
weaker than what you think it is. Like even just thinking about evolution, like think how evolution, it can only move one step at a time and every step has to be beneficial. But think about when you're like building a wing on an airplane, the wing is only useful when it's completely constructed, right? Only when you finish it off, does it start to work? If it's like halfway built, it's not going to make the airplane fly. In fact, it's going to be at a disadvantage compared to something else that didn't have a halfly formed wing on it. But evolution, for evolution to work, each step has to be beneficial. But clearly, when you're building stuff, you have to go through all these steps that wouldn't be. So wouldn't the evolutionary pressure stop those steps from ever being made? Because according to evolution, the blind watchmaker theory says that like evolution doesn't know what it's moving towards. It just moves towards something. But that would only work if each step were beneficial. So you like think about a bird forming a wing. It doesn't just form a wing in one step, right? No, according to evolution, it's all these micro steps of a little thing sprouting out. And like a feather doesn't just appear in one generation. So whatever made that. According to evolution, it says that that just the, it became kind of like a feather and then it stuck out a little more, but none of those would bring any benefit. It only is beneficial once it's a fully formed wing. Then the benefit would kick in. That clearly shows teleology, that whatever made feathers on birds and wings knew that that's what it was moving towards, or I believe made it instantaneously. There's no way it could have moved that towards that step by step because the benefit curve, if you looked at it, would be like partial wing, close to a feather, a little more close to a feather. It would not be giving any benefit. In fact, it would be giving a handicap until it finally was a fully formed wing and then it worked and the benefit would go like that. So that right there is like one example of how evolution doesn't even make sense logically how that could occur. Each little step isn't going to be beneficial, the completed thing would be. But to get the completed thing, you would have to go through millions of years of moving towards it or at least thousands of years or however long it takes to make a wing <laughs> that wouldn't be and then finally it would be but evolution doesn't know what it's moving towards it's blind so that's one example of how evolution doesn't work i mean just in general evolution's ridiculous evolution says that the greatest order in the universe is made by entropy right because according to evolution it's random mutation i.e pure entropy which is designing things and yet that's absurd it's like saying that you drive a car through a sandstorm and all the pieces of sand just happen to hit the car in such a way that it gets out of the sandstorm and it's like it went from like an audi a7 to an audi a7 turbo because just randomly the sand hitting it just happened to make that occur it's ridiculous the whole idea that evolution is what designed the most complex super ordered states of the universe and yet what powered it was entropy we don't see entropy behaving like that anywhere in the whole universe in fact entropy is the opposite entropy is disorder it doesn't design anything there's no place where you can take something throw it through a bunch of entropy and the entropy just makes it super advanced and yet entropy has no intelligence that's absurd so to say that everything was created by entropy Entropy doesn't do that. You can observe it in any possible realm. It never does that. It never brings more order. By definition, it's chaos. It's disorder. So evolution is like this weird way of packaging an absurdity saying that, you know, entropy just made everything that's super ordered. But entropy never does that. That's the very, it's against its nature. You know, so anyway, evolution's absurd. I, I, th I think that things can adapt, but that's something the creator gave them the ability to do. It can't become a totally different thing. Like, there's no way you could get step by step random motion that would just happen to like evolve into some other thing unless you knew ahead of time what it was moving towards and you were willing to bear a bunch of costs. But evolution says it can't do that because each individual mutation, each individual uh, iteration of it has to be more beneficial than the last. That's what evolution says. And yet you'd have to go through these long periods with a handicap to finally get to the completed version that worked. You know, does that make sense? Like if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff like this that contradicts evolution. I'm going to save that for another sermon because I've thought about it a lot, but this sermon's about trusting the word of God. It really does make sense if you think about it, but there is true antinomy, have the humility intellectually to accept the antinomy Ever since I've been reborn, I'm just like, man, if the word of God says it, it must be true. It's simple, but it works really well because uh, it is true. It's that simple. A lot of people say like, well, you know, the Christianity has good moral principles. And so, you know, if, you know, even if there is no God, we should still act like there is. And like, ah, to me, that's ridiculous. We should act like there is a God because there is a God, not because it would be good if blah, 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 blah. The reason it works well to believe in God is because there is a God, not because it just happens to form a useful fiction based on a blah, 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 blah. Let's keep it simple. Let's, let's let God, you know, use us to shame the wise things of the world with our own, you know, foolishness and, you know, uh, which is really wisdom in the form of the cross. So then it's not foolishness, but then, you know, hey, his strength's perfected in our weakness. So, okay, oh, it's been an hour. Maybe I should cut it off there. I think I said most of all the things I was going to say. 
But anyway, I hope this sermon on antinomy uh, has been interesting to you. I had fun creating it, and I thank the Lord for helping me. And hey, we clocked it in under an hour, baby. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, everyone. More sermons uh, coming soon. Thank you, everyone, for all uh, your comments. I do see at least most of them. Um, but yeah, I'll come back at you guys soon. I hope that this has been helpful. Let's accept antinomy because it is true. Okay. Love, everyone. And let's keep persevering and doing what we can for the Lord. Let's hunger for righteousness because he will fulfill us. So I thank the Lord Jesus Christ, and I say, bless you, God the Father, bless you, God the Son, Christ Jesus, and bless you, Mr. Holy Spirit. Okay, everybody, I'll see you guys soon. Talk soon. Bye.